Hi, my name is Vincent Young. I'm from the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Division of Infectious Diseases. Clostridium difficile is a significant uh, healthcare problem nowadays. Um, the actually estimated cost in the United States each year is over $3 billion, and it's responsible for an estimated 16,000 deaths, and about a half a million people suffer from C. difficile infection every year. Clostridium difficile usually arises in patients who are in the hospital and are being treated with antibiotics for an infection, and this infection may not involve their gastrointestinal tract. Uh, what happens with the patients is that they start to develop diarrhea and abdominal pain. In severe cases, they can have hypotension. They can actually become septic, and uh, as noted earlier, a number of them will actually expire from the illness. It's an estimated that 16,000 people will die each year from C. difficile infection. It's interesting that there are this, is this problem of so-called resistance in C. difficile. In and of itself, Clostridium difficile is often resistant to many drugs naturally, and that's why it arises when patients are put on antibiotics for another infection. The real problem is that it is sensitive to a number of antibiotics, and these can be successfully used to treat C. difficile infection. The traditional antibiotics have been metronidazole and vancomycin, and resistance to these organisms is actually fairly rare in Clostridium difficile. However, for reasons that we're not exactly sure, patients can be successfully treated with these antibiotics, and then when these antibiotics are stopped, their C. difficile infection will recur. And this is not necessarily due to what's classically considered to be antibiotic resistance. So the patients who have recurrent C. difficile, they might be treated with an antibiotic that's directed against the C. difficile, and while they are on that antibiotic, they will actually improve clinically. Their diarrhea will resolve, they won't have the abdominal pain. But what happens is when they stop the C. difficile treatment, within several days, sometimes within several hours, but often within a few weeks, the patient will have recurrent diarrhea, and if we test for Clostridium difficile, they will again be positive. Now, there are a number of theories as to why this is occurring. Uh, there is some evidence that some patients aren't able to mount a good immune response, and the immune response is actually necessary to completely clear the disease. The antibiotics themselves will not just clear C. difficile. And in other cases, it's thought, and we have done that, the other bacteria that are in your gut, the so-called microbiome, or the indigenous microbiome of the gut, is altered. Normally, the normal gut bacteria are able to keep C. difficile at bay, but due to a number of reasons, patients might not have the normal bacteria in their gut to restore so-called colonization re resistance against C. difficile. And so when the patient stops taking the antibiotics against C. difficile, since they don't have a normal complement of bacteria in their gut, the C. difficile will start to expand again, it produces its toxin, and the patient will have clinical disease once more. Well, since it's thought that at least a portion of patients who have recurrent C. difficile have so because they don't have the normal bacteria in their gut, it would make sense that you would want to try to replenish the bacteria that are normally present in their gut. Right now, the most effective way that we know to do this is to actually transplant the feces from another person. Oftentimes, this is a, a, a close relative, such as a spouse or a brother or sister, you take their feces and you transplant it into the patient and hopefully restore the normal complement of bacteria that are present in their gut. So fecal transplant has been administered a number of ways. It can actually be placed, as we say, from above. And the typical way this is done is that a nasogastric tube is put through the nose into the stomach, and then a fecal slurry is administered that way, and you allow the bacteria to travel through the gut. Now, some people don't like that idea, obviously. It's also been administered through the rectum, and the typical way this has been done is one, actually there are two ways that fecal transplant is commonly administered uh, f through the rectum. One is through a colonoscope, and you know, people are familiar with using the colonoscope to diagnose and screen colon cancer, but you can also instill things through the colonoscope. And what they will do is they'll put the colonoscope in relatively high in the colon, and as they withdraw it, they'll instill the suspension of feces. 
It can also simply be given through an enema. And actually, enema administration has been instructed to patients, and it can be done at home. They use an enema bag. They're given the uh, saline that they can use to make the fecal suspension, and this would be administered at home. Regardless of how the fecal transplant is administered, I think one of the more remarkable things, and there are a couple of recent analyses of a number of trials, is that the success rate for fecal transplant is on the order of about 90 to 95 percent, depending on the study. And this is quite interesting in the fact that antibiotics have a very poor success rate, particularly for patients who have had multiple recurrences. It is unlikely that fecal transplant will replace antibiotics as first-line treatment for an initial episode of C. difficile infection. Uh, recurrent disease only occurs in a fraction, depending on the study, maybe 20% of patients who have an initial episode of C. difficile. And actually, the majority of those patients who experience one relapse will be successfully treated with another round of either the same antibiotic or perhaps one of the other first-line agents that are used to treat C. difficile infection. I think the real use for fecal transplant in the near future is for those patients who have multiple recurrences of disease. In this case, when they have failed multiple rounds of antibiotics, uh, that's probably where a number of clinicians might use fecal transplant as a first line. Some, in, uh, some uh, physicians, however, still don't like the idea of giving fecal transplantation and will try multiple techniques such as switching the antibiotics or tapering the antibiotics, which have varying degrees of success. Well, currently, for example, if you're doing fecal transplant and you're instructing the patient on how to do home fecal transplant enemas, that type of reimbursement would be the normal reimbursement that a physician would get for an office visit, and this would not be a procedure per se. Obviously, if the fecal transplant is being done via colonoscopy, it is possible that the procedure would be reimbursed at that point. Again, not having expertise in terms of how insurance reimburses for certain types of procedures and what they consider are medically necessary, it's not clear how one would increase the reimbursement for fecal transplant above and beyond the uh, normal office visit. And again, this is particularly talking about having patients administer, self-administer a fecal enema at home.